the Forest Preserves of Cook County Centennial Anniversary Launch. I'm Bill Curtis. I'll be serving as your moderator for the panel and your host today. It's an exciting day because everybody in this room shares a common love of nature. And we are here to celebrate the wonderful things that are taking place throughout the Cook County Forest Preserves and what is planned for the future. I feel lucky to have had a number of incredible experiences in the last year, um, being able to choose uh, some of the stories uh, in, in my uh, re uh, re um, well, I don't know, a reintroduction, I guess, to the television business for a couple years with Walter Jacobson. And so I chose a bald eagle nest in Palos, uh, and there they were, you know, occupying the highest. Now, if you haven't had the perspective of actually climbing up into a nest, I didn't do it this time, but I have been up there. And uh, I would challenge the common notion that uh, the eyes of a bald eagle are eight times uh, what a human eye is. Because when I got up there, I could see fish floating uh, on, on the surface. I say, well, hell, it's easy if you choose the right spot. And then, of course, we made the mistake of actually going pupping, coyote pupping, with uh, some of the experts uh, in the Forest Preserve. They were great, but once they got the puppies out and got them on camera, they looked like real puppies. And I said, you little rascals, uh, you know, you're going to grow up and we're going to want to shoot you. <laughs> so, that, so that was not exactly a good idea. But <laughs> before, before we get started, uh, I would like to join the centennial conversation today on Twitter. Here is your uh, tweet, hashtag FP, and I presume that's for Forest Preserve, right, Bill? FP100. So uh, have at it. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, known to many people as the president of the Cook County Board. Uh, if you don't know her as the president of the Cook County Board, you'll get another chance because she just announced she's going to run again. Um, also, her title is president of the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, and she is a true friend. I'm just a little nervous because I look down at her chair and it's empty. Oh, here she is. Look at that. You can tell when a politician is campaigning because they are ready to go. Tony Preckwinkle. So good morning, everybody. I'm very grateful that all of you uh, joined us today. I'm very grateful to Bill for that uh, kind introduction uh, and for agreeing to serve as our, our MC this morning. I, I want to acknowledge a few folks who are here before I begin my remarks. First of all, we have a couple of, uh, of our commissioners for the Forest Preserve District here. I'd ask them both to stand. Uh, Commissioner John Daly and Commissioner Elizabeth Duty Gorman, would you both stand? Thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge a couple other elected officials. Um, from the office of the Governor of Illinois, uh, the Chief of Protocol, Brendan Daly. Brendan, are you with us? Stand up. And we also have the Village Manager of Glencoe, Paul Harlow. Paul, would you stand for us, please? All right, thank you. And Commissioner Tim Schneider, where are you, Tim? Right here. All right, stand up. There we go. Thank you, Mary, for the prompt. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, uh, we have, we are blessed with uh, a wonderful Forest Preserve District that's one of the oldest in the country and also one of the largest. Um, and I, I have to tell you that, uh, full disclosure, I didn't realize until after I started running for this office that uh, I would be both 
president of the county and president of the Forest Preserve District if I won the election. Um, but I, you know, and I, and I frankly didn't have a lot of experience in our forest preserves. Um, every year I would go to uh, President John Stroger's 8th Ward Democratic Organization picnic at 159th and Torrance, but that was about my only uh, encounter with the forest preserves. And now, of course, um, I have responsibility for this great, wonderful resource, and I'm, I'm grateful. 69,000 acres, 69,000 acres. Uh, that's an incredible resource. You know, unfortunately, um, for many of our municipal governments, looking at preserving the natural environment is, is kind of an afterthought. There are all kinds of things that come ahead of it. Uh, balancing the budgets, economic development, and looking at uh, kind of the wild open spaces in our county is, is often an afterthought. And we're, we're really blessed that 100 years ago, a lot of volunteers came together to preserve, to preserve these natural areas. And they help us to control floods in our neighborhoods, clean and cool our air, improve our health and our quality of life for the 5.3 million people who live in our county. A hundred years ago, these leaders predicted the growth of our region. And they understood that it was important to preserve these natural areas for the pleasure, education, and recreation of all our residents, especially those who live in the densest urban areas. They started with just this vision and a single piece of property, Deer Grove. Today, as I said, the Forest Preserve District accounts for 11% of the county, 69,000 acres, and we're continuing to acquire land to increase the amount of green space that we have for our residents and future generations. It took leadership, volunteers, and partners, and a real respect for the value of open space to make these places forever part of the fabric of Cook County. We were the first forest preserve district in Illinois and one of the first in the nation, and we were in the forefront of the restoration movement when these lands were impacted by pollution, urbanization, and invasive species and will continue to be a leader in this arena in the future. So today we're here to kick off our centennial celebration and to reaffirm our commitment to these ideals, civic leadership, volunteerism, and partnerships with a deep respect for nature. I'm very excited to see so many of you here today. It's great to have a full auditorium because I believe that it shows our commitment to preservation of the forest preserves for the next 100 years. I want to wholeheartedly thank the many people in this room who have been committed to this effort over time, not just for today, but for future generations. You know, I often say that, you know, government, I believe in government, government can do good things, but government alone can't do all the things that need to be done in a community, a society, a county. And we're grateful for all of you who volunteer your time and contribute your money to helping us in the forest preserves. In the summer of 2011, I said it was my goal that we should introduce 2,000 children to the forest preserves by working with community groups and civic organizations to help bridge the gap between those kids and the preserves. All of us in Cook County pay for our forest preserves, uh, but our use of the forest preserve is not evenly distributed geographically. Lots of kids in the city don't know anything about the forest preserves. Um, and the forest preserves are kind of an emerald ring around the city of Chicago, and we need to work hard to be sure that all of our residents across the county are not only aware of the forest preserves, but come out to use them. Little did we know how successful we would be. Our goal was 2,000. Since that time, I'm proud to say that we've introduced tens of thousands of young people to the forest preserves for the very first time, creating a strong foundation for the next generation of volunteers and stewards. We have a bigger goal in mind for the centennial celebration to reach nearly all of the residents of Cook County and invite them to discover, enjoy, and appreciate the forest preserves. As we look forward, let me sum up our goals. First, that we renew our vow to preserve biodiversity and our natural wonders in a fully developed urban area. We have been presented by an extraordinary gift, and it's critical that we make sure it's restored and preserved for future generations. 
Second, that we expand the types of experiences people can have in the forest preserve, on foot, by bike, by boat. Three, that we ignite passion and understanding of this asset among all Cook County residents to the point that they know it and love it and want to protect it. The forest preserves are one of the greatest treasures in the Chicago area, and we intend to proclaim that far and wide. And finally, in addition to all the wonderful people at the Chicago Zoological Society, thank you, and the Chicago Botanic Garden, thank you, and our many other partners in this room who are committed to our vision, we have connected in a meaningful way to new partners. None of us can do these things alone. To achieve these goals, I knew we needed solid leadership in place in the forest preserves, and I'd like to thank Arnold Randall and Mary Lariah for their good work and for all the staff who have worked so hard over the time that I have been president and, and long before to make the forest preserves wonderful places. Would, uh, would Arnold Randall and Mary stand up, please? I want you to know that I hear everywhere I go uh, gratitude for the change in leadership at the Forest Preserve and what that's meant for their uh, cleanliness, for the, the way in which our staff interact with, with, our, with our visitors. Um, I'm very grateful to both of, both of you and to all of our staff for the good work that you do. And I know that, that Arnold will acknowledge them more fully in his remarks to come, but I want to thank and ask to stand as well Wendy Paulson, Eric Whitaker, John McCarter, and Art Velasquez, who the, are the co-chairs of our Centennial Commission. Please stand. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your interest in our Forest Preserve District. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. It's good to have a believer in a leadership position, isn't it? Now to share a vision for the Centennial Campaign, General Superintendent Arnold Randall. Since Since taking on uh, this role in December of 2010, he has literally been everywhere in the county and in the forest preserves, as he will tell you. Before Arnold uh, joined the forest preserve, he served as the director of the Office of Civic Engagement at the University of Chicago, where he helped plan and coordinate major public projects that were undertaken by the university. He's played a key role in uh, the Chicago 2016 Olympic bid and the community outreach team and previously served as commissioner of the uh, city of Chicago's Department of Planning and Development and has held several key leadership roles in the Chicago Park District. So please welcome General Superintendent Arnold Randall. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for those uh, kind remarks. Uh, on behalf of uh, Mary Lariah, our Deputy General Superintendent, myself, I want to again thank you for being here. This is a great day for us, and we're thrilled to be here with hundreds of our closest friends and family, Forest Preserve family, so thank you for being here. Um, before we talk about the centennial celebration, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the tremendous leadership of President Tony Preckwinkle. You just had a chance to hear her speak, and our entire Board of Commissioners. Uh, the President has provided a clear mandate for reform and accountability both for the larger Cook County government and specifically for us here in the Forest Preserves. Under her leadership, this organization has made incredible progress from completing our first ever desk audit, uh, to renewing our focus on stewardship and volunteerism, and to being the on only the second city or county agency to achieve substantial compliance with the Shackman consent decrees, an accomplishment that pr proves that we're successfully eliminating political consideration from our hiring and employment processes. It has been a remarkable two and a half years, and I want to thank you personally, President Preckwinkle. I wish I could name all the organizations that have dedicated time, resources, and the financial support to the Forest Preserve uh, and its conservation efforts, education, and recreation initiatives, either with Forest Preserve staff or on their own staff. Today, I, I say thank you to all of our partners, including the entire Chicago Wilderness Alliance, an organization which I proudly chair. Uh, our 72 incredible site stewards, the folks who are out there every day of the year, uh, rain or shine, 
10 degrees or 90 degrees, they're out there working in our preserves, thank you, and our thousands of volunteers. The Forest Preserve Foundation, the Friends of the Forest Preserves, uh, the Chicago Zoological Society and Chicago, Chicago Botanic Garden are two of our key partners, part of us, and our more than 100 partner organizations that include governmental and non-governmental agencies, coalitions, foundations, and businesses. Behind me you're seeing a series of slides that list the organizations that are part of our collaborative effort and we're committed to growing this list and looking forward to new partners joining us in protecting the forest preserves for the next hundred years. Like the President, I've been on a journey of discovery within the forest preserves over these past several years. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you. That's New Year's Day by the way, so it's a little chilly. <laughs> really committed, right? And it's been one of the, uh, uh, very honestly, one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had. I tell this, I tell people often, this is the best job I've ever had, and it is. And I've had pretty, some pretty good jobs. Uh, we're proud to have uh, one of the very first forest preserve systems in the country, founded over 100 years ago, in a process that took several years to complete, hence the multi-year cel centennial celebration. And now we have one of the largest, encompassing nearly 69,000 acres. In spite of this, the truth is that many people in the county, this audience excluded of course, don't have an appreciation for the incredible diversity of our lands. They don't know yet that our holdings are amongst the most geologically unique and biologically rich in the United States. Through the forest preserves, our residents have access to countless habitats. Our assets offer experiences and benefits to every single one of our residents, whether they ever sit foot in the forest preserve or not. The fact is that no matter where you live or work in Cook County, you are never much farther away than 25 minutes uh, from being immersed in nature. Not only, not many metropolitan areas can, in this country can claim this, and we're unbelievably fortunate to have this asset. I personally have visited the vast majority of our sites, either in my role as general superintendent, but also with my family. I make a point to get out to our activities uh, with my children, and they will tell me if it's good or bad, and, and mostly it's good, and they have good experiences. Um, you know how three-year-olds can be very honest. Uh, that's a real testament to just how extensive the Forest Preserve system is, and a tribute to the vision of leaders over 100 years ago. Uh, before we get to our plans for the centennial, I want to take a moment to share even more about the forest preserves. And here's just a snapshot of what is out there for everyone to enjoy. Experience the wonders of nature. One hundred years ago, visionaries decided to set aside natural areas for preservation in and around Chicago. The formation of the forest preserves encompassed years of effort by civic leaders and prominent urban planners and landscape architects to protect open space in Cook County. A century later, forest preserves make up 11% of all land in Cook County nearly 69,000 acres. From wooded wetlands to tall grass prairies, oak woodlands to savannas, the forest preserves of Cook County contain some of the most geologically and biologically rich natural areas in the United States. The result of preserving these natural areas? Unparalleled benefits for people who live here. Clean air and clean water. Green and open space. A great gift for everyone, whether they set foot in the preserves or not. For those who do, the opportunity to interact with and experience nature impacts how we see the world around us. The forest preserves successfully merge people with nature, all in an urban environment. They provide a place to escape, a place to stretch your legs and spread your wings, a place to marvel at the beauty, a place to become rejuvenated, a place to feel free, a place to listen to the quiet, a place to experience more than you ever expected. 
69,000 acres, hundreds of miles of trails, dedicated nature preserves, lakes, ponds, and seven major waterways, picnic groves, youth camps, golf courses, nature centers filled with treasures, and two world-renowned institutions in the Chicago Zoological Society's Brookfield Zoo and the Chicago Botanic Garden, and much, much more. The forest preserves are as important to Chicago's identity, economic viability, and quality of life as our lakefront. 100 years and counting. The forest preserves of Cook County experience the wonders of nature. Pretty incredible, right? <laughs> I just want to personally thank Bill Curtis for moderating. He always makes those much more interesting when he's talking. So thank you, Bill. Um, you may have noticed at the end uh, of that uh, that our logo looks a little different. Uh, it's because we're using our centennial as an opportunity to, re to refresh our brand and introduce ourselves to a large, diverse audience in a new way. We're starting with our name itself, some minor changes, but significant ones. While our legal name will always be the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, um, we will simply be known uh, now as the Forest Preserves of Cook County. We want to say to everyone, come visit the preserves. There are so many unique experiences you can spend a lifetime discovering what's out there. We've also taken a more modern approach to our logo with a cleaner look and an inviting image welcoming you into the preserves. So it could be a path, a river, or a stream. Uh, you can decide for yourself. Uh, these brand changes will come over time, of course, as we replace signage and other physical changes, but we want to be good stewards of our financial resources as well. As we start our centennial campaign, you will begin to see this new name and look on all sorts of things, so stay tuned. In many ways, the centennial has really arrived at a perfect moment in time. Uh, though we are the forest preserves of Cook County, we are linked environmentally and socially to many other ecosystems well beyond our borders. Our lands comprise the largest clean air resource in the region, cleansing and cooling the air we breathe. The forest preserves are also the region's greatest rainwater retainer, very significant this spring. Um, absorbing, cleaning, and evaporating hundreds of millions of gallons of rainwater that fall in the county each year, protecting hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses from flooding. Uh, we are the heart and lungs of the region, and our future is vital to the future of Chicago and the Chicago region. More than 100 threatened or, in, or endangered species have been found in Cook County. So think about that for a minute. Right here in one of the country's largest urban centers, we are home to such diversity and such fragile creatures. It's our job to protect them by actively preserving these rare habitats that these species need to thrive. Without us, many of these species, species would become extinct. Our lands provide critical resting and refueling points for migratory birds headed elsewhere. And they also serve as both a breeding and wintering ground for many bird species. Some of them are rare. And some of them are migrating here from as far away as Argentina or the Arctic of Canada. For the second year in a row, after an absence of more than 100 years, uh, and Bill talked about this earlier, but a bald eagle family is nesting in the forest preserves. Perhaps they heard about our centennial or decided it was time to come home. <laughs> we thank them. <clears throat> In case you're wondering, the latest observation by our wildlife biologists is that the nest has one eaglet and is getting bigger by the day. Both adults have been seen bringing in food. The reality is that we're all interconnected. Globally, what we do here matters. And as Cook County residents, we all benefit from these efforts, which, helps me, which leads me to our charge. Over the next three years, as we celebrate our centennial, we will strengthen our commitment to restoring valuable natural areas to ecological health while inspiring new users from throughout the county to take advantage of this tremendous resource. This is more than about cosmetic changes. This is tied to real planning, practical management decisions, and setting up the right structure to accomplish our goals. As you may know, my background, as Bill mentioned, is a city planner and a parks and open space manager. Uh, what's exciting to me about our next century planning efforts is that we've taken an opportunity to chart in-depth roadmaps for our future. From our habitats and trail master plans that are now underway, currently underway, to our recently completed recreation and camping master plans, we are being strategic and systematic in our efforts to achieve our goals. 
In addition to our own forest preserve led planning, we're partnering with Open Lands and Metropolis Strategies on a significant project we're calling the Next Century Conservation Plan. Together, our organizations are undertaking an ambitious study of best practices in the conservation and education fields to develop a series of recommendations for our next 100 years. This effort is funded through the Chicago Community Trust, thank you very much, and we're grateful for their support. This work is being led by a stellar commission comprised of many Chicago area leaders, some of whom are in the room here today and the president mentioned, but I'm gonna mention them again. Uh, so our co-chairs are Wendy Paulson, John McCarter, formerly of the Field Museum, Art Velasquez, and Dr. Eric Whitaker. We wanna thank you very much for your contributions. We appreciate the work that's already begun and we look forward to early next year when we can share everything that you've learned and you've created. We're also working with an environment-focused organization located right here in Chicago. The Center for Humans and Nature is an organization where, as they say, ideas really matter. The center is focused on thinking creatively about how people can make better decisions in relationship with each other and with the rest of nature. As part of the centennial, we're, the center is asking some of the nation's best minds to tackle the question, how, how nature is critical in a 21st century urban ethic. We invite everyone here today to contribute to that dialogue. There's information about both the Next Century work and the center in your folders today. So when you get a chance, I'd, I'd ask you to take a look at that. And the people involved will also be in the lobby after today's program if you'd like to hear more. Over the next three years, the time frame which we plan to celebrate our centennial, one of our major goals is to do a better job of communicating the importance of the preserves to this region. We want people to feel as fiercely protective of the preserve land as they do the lakefront. So that's a big charge. You know, everybody, when you think about Chicago and the Chicago region, you think about the lakefront, you think about its culture and museums and all these wonderful attributes. We want you to think about, we want everyone to think about the forest preserves in that same sentence, that we are just as important, if not more important, than all of those assets. We won't be able to do this without our many partners and volunteers who have worked with us to develop our plans and stewardship, internship, education, and recreation programs. President Preckwickle uh, outlined the major goals of our centennial, but I'd like to touch on two of the goals that are very important to me personally. I'm committed to making sure that everyone in Cook County has a chance to experience nature. It truly does make a difference in your quality of life when you can connect or in some cases reconnect with nature. And we want the visitors to our preserves to reflect the wonderful diversity of our county and we won't rest until this is a reality. Uh, I am a, a city dweller. I've lived in the city my whole life. Uh, I know and I see young people and families every day who would really benefit from being in nature uh, for a lot, on a lot of different levels. It is a quality of life issue for our residents. As the president said, everybody who lives here is paying through property taxes, paying for this resource. They should enjoy it and it will frankly make us a better society. We're really committed to that. We also want to strengthen our ties to all the wonderful volunteers and partners. Everyone who has been with us for decades out in the field doing the hard work on the ground and keeping these habitats healthy. I know that your efforts have made a tremendous difference and will be, vited for the, be vital for the next 100 years. So what exactly is our centennial celebration? What will we be doing over the next three years? At the heart of our centennial plan is a series of legacy projects that we will enhance the quality of what the preserves offer to Cook County residents and the region and help expand the way people experience the preserves. I'm excited to announce some legacy projects to you today. Many of them are very real and already underway, so you may have even heard about some of them, while others are aspirational and will require outside partnerships and funding. We've, we've divided them into three groups. The planning we have done and will be doing, the physical changes we'll be making, and the programs that we'll be creating. The good news is that many of these important pieces are already underway, especially in the area of planning. As you know, with input from many of you here today, we've already completed our recreation, land acquisition, and camping master plans, which are available now and can be viewed on our website. Currently underway are three more important planning pieces. The Next Century Conservation Plan, which I mentioned, the Habitat Restoration Master Plan, which will guide our efforts in making certain that plant, animal, and habitat diversity survives and flourishes for the next 100 years. This is responsible, this responsible management of these lands is at the core of what we do. This is probably the, uh, the thing that the general public probably understands the least. We are, we are here to manage and protect these lands and to grow them, to, 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 uh, to add to them. That's really the core of our mission. And to make sure that people can witness and enjoy all this diversity in our preserves, we are taking, undertaking, an under, uh, undertaking a system-wide trail master plan. As for the physical changes that we'll be seeing in the preserves, I'd like to give, share with you a few key projects. Next summer, we'll be dedicating the first of our new campgrounds. We have an ambitious goal of building bunkhouses, tent cabins, tent pads by the time we conclude, conclude our centennial celebration in 2015. 
These camp experiences will provide a new way for families in our area and beyond to experience nature. We want to have opportunities with the campgrounds for novices, people who've never camped before. We always use, there's a, I won't name the person on my staff who talks about never having been camping but would like to take his daughters, to the person who's camped a lot who can throw a backpack on and find a spot in camp. We want to create different opportunities for everybody. And the reality is if you can't have that opportunity, uh, whether it's here, I know the park district's doing some things with camping and you can't do it in Cook County, you may never camp at all. So we want to create opportunities for people who've never done it because we believe believe that camping is one way to get people in touch with nature early on, early in life, and that they'll be committed for the rest of their lives. So we think that's a signature project for us. With the Gateways to Nature program, we will be redesigning entrances at highly visible locations throughout the county to encourage people to enter into the forest preserves. These gateways may include improved entrance and trail signage, enhanced visitor information, uh, special nature ambassadors to help guide visitors, and much more. This effort will require new partners, and we are confident that working with our foundation, we'll be able to find them. There's more to come on that. We are working right now to implement innovative interpretive plans at two key sites, so at, in Tinley Creek to the south and Deer Grove, which we referenced earlier to the north. These are sites that will serve as a new model for people to experience, explore, and understand natural diversity. They will have an interpretive elements, in, including artistic features, innovative signage, apps, because technology is here, it's not going anywhere, and other new technology. We want to thank Open Lands, uh, Jerry Edelman and his folks, for donating the architectural and interpretive uh, design for this work. We also hope to commission an art installation to commemorate the centennial at an appropriate site. We haven't figured out where that's going to be, but we think the centennial is significant enough that we, do, we should leave something permanent for folks to remember. We will also be issuing a call for entries this fall with the goal of a dedication in 2015. Those are some of the, just some of the physical things that we're planning, and as for programs, it's important to note that we already have many, many wonderful programs at our nature centers, which are phenomenal, uh, and across the preserves. But we also know we need to do more to attract the next generation. We do nice things, we need to do more. That is very clear to me. To connect with people that who are not already here and to form new partnerships. To do this, we'll need to expand our existing programs and create new ones. For example, we all know that the health benefits of spending time in nature, both physically and mentally, but we need to strengthen our connections with the healthcare community. It seems like an obvious thing to do, but it's not something that's happened before. Working with our own Cook County Health System, and we met with Terry Mason and others, uh, and especially with the hospitals that are near our preserves, we'll be conducting an extensive outreach campaign to link healthcare providers with specific ways to engage with nature, such as offering prescriptions for nature as a part of a health your lifestyle. I've already mentioned, uh, as I've already mentioned, we are doing a great deal in regard to how we interpret our natural lands. We're going to expand those efforts by issuing technology, a technology challenge to our growing tech community, a competition to submit a, a plan that in effect puts the forest preserve at your fingertips. Everybody's got those smartphones, right? Certainly the teenagers do. Um, we hope that the mobile experience they conceptualize will allow visitors to interact with information about the preserves and also to share their own observations and content. Uh, we will also be expanding our current programming around fostering the next generation of conservation leaders through educational initiative, initiatives for diverse audiences, including expanding the, our science fair awards, growing the Mighty Acorn program, which has been a staple for us for many years and a great program, increasing the number of groups participating in citizen scientists in action, and adding new opportunities for conservation internships. That's really key. <laughs> And we plan to introduce conservation, key conservation months to encourage even more new people to put, on their, to put their boots on the ground and engage in the vital restoration and protection efforts that keep our public lands thriving. Through this call to action, we intend to continue to grow, invest in, train, and support a volunteer force that focuses on the eradication of invasive species in our forest preserves and serve as a frontline ambassador who speak passionately about the preserves. Word of mouth cannot be overstated. It's really important that the folks who are in the preserves talk to other people and get them in the preserves. I think that is one of the key ways that we'll get more usership. To our stewards, I want you to know that while historically the Forest Preserve District has not always seen eye to eye with our stewards, I want you to know that we are just every bit as passionate about these lands and committed to protect them as you are. We are on the same page in this, in this way. I know that we can use this mutual passion to get them to the state they, they deserve to be. Finally, I want, we'll upgrade our trail maps and our wayfinding signage in it with an emphasis on integrating new, techno, new technology. These maps will showcase the preserve's 300 plus mile trail system and illustrate shared connections in an inviting, informational, and interactive way. Our centennial plan is a living, breathing document, and we anticipate that we'll adapt it through the course of our three-year celebration as we assess and evaluate what's been done. 
I'm incredibly proud of all that is already in motion and all we aspire to achieve. We have made no little plans. We dare to dream big. The Forest Reserve's big, right? But as pres the President said before, we cannot do this alone. So don't be surprised because I'm going to make, make some ass of those of you in this audience uh, today. And I hope that the direction we're headed is one that you can get excited about. At the Forest Preserves, our passion and commitment to stewardship both to taxpayer resources and the land starts with the tremendous leadership of Board President Tony Preckwinkle and our Board of Commissioners. It also extends through the ranks of our staff and volunteers. If I can leave you with ways you can help us, it would be to engage with nature in your own lives, which everybody I'm speaking to the choir here, everybody does, um, and to help us spread the word. First, I invite you to visit the Forest Preserves and bring your friends and family. Second, we actually have some postcards for you that you can send after your trip. So we want you to write a note, what you experience. We've even included the postage with the special Forest Preserve stamps. So you don't even have to buy a stamp. You can you have a Forest Preserve stamp. Tell your friends what you saw, invite them to visit. If everyone in this room commits to that small step, we can begin to build a new generation of ambassadors. Third, I hope you all stay connected with what we're doing as, as we hold events, mark milestones, and engage with partners in a much bigger way at fpdcc.com backslash 100. You see it right there on the screen. And we intend to make some noise over the next, excuse me, over the next several years. At the end of the day, we want everyone to experience the wonders of nature right here in Cook County. Everyone in this room is part of helping us spread the word as we reaffirm our commitment to protecting the diversity of our plants and animals that depend on the preserves and introduce new educational and recreational opportunities for the residents of this county. 100 years ago, the leaders of this county saw the wisdom of giving the great gift to the masses, to everyone of the forest preserves. Today, it is our collective responsibility to make sure that this great gift endures for the next 100 years and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnold. Our keynote speaker today is a pioneer, has been in the green and conservation movement since 1995. She had a great idea. When her last child graduated from college, unlike the rest of us who just go in and fix the room up so we can use it, um, she said, hey, I'm going to get my husband and we're going to travel to almost every national park in the country. And so off they go, 12,000 miles, to experience, to see, and later to report. And they were transformed by the stunning beauty, history, and culture of our national parks and forests. They saw, however, less than a handful of Hispanic, Asian, African, or Native American heritage uh, uh, enjoying the uh, great American outdoors or working in them. Recognizing that this was a problem, it stemmed probably from lack of information and misconceptions and latent fears about being in the woods, Audrey Peterman resolved to become a catalyst for change. She is among the leading experts on America's publicly owned land system, a tenacious advocate for breaking the color barrier and integration of our natural treasures as a way for all Americans, including children, youth, adults, and seniors, regardless of ethnic heritage, to better appreciate our collective history and achieve a full democratic society. She's a great storyteller, uh, which is apparent in her book, Legacy on the Land, as she describes the adventures that she had from the East Coast to the West in the national parks. She has spent the last few days experiencing the wonders of the Cook County Forest Preserves, where her infectious passion for nature has been seen by everyone and is filtering in even today. So as they say, boy, you're going to hear Audrey Peterman. We welcome Audrey Peterman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, Cook County Forest Preserve and lovers of the Forest Preserve. I am so happy to be here with you this morning. I just really can't even express it. And most of all, I'm happy because I'm able to tell you, you are doing it better 
than anybody I've seen across the country. <laughs> Cook County, yes. Cook County can be the template and the example for appreciation of your natural resources and the engagement of all sectors of the community with your natural treasures. That is a very, very big deal to me. And I am so fortunate that I've been here over the past um, couple of days and um, I've had the opportunity to travel with um, General Superintendent Randall and Mayor Laria and members of the executive leadership team and everybody has treated me so wonderfully. I feel very, very special and very, very fortunate. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about my story, a, a, a slightly different aspect. When our last daughter graduated from college, the, I had, let's try this again. I've been lucky enough to marry the most brilliant and wonderful man in the world, okay? <laughs> His name is Frank, he's awesome. He was over here today, but he couldn't make it because we had another uh, a conflicting commitment. When our last daughter graduated from college, we said, what are we gonna do with our lives now, right? And we decided that we wanted to move to Belize in Central America because he had seen this piece on television about how you know, the Belizean people really valued their environment and thought it was the most important thing that they had to leave to their descendants. So we thought we'd go to Belize and open a bed and breakfast and um, go to bed at night with the sound of the howler monkeys in our ears kind of thing. It'd be very romantic and very wonderful, right? So we went down to Belize to check it out. And on the last day before we got back, we fell madly in love with the country. The last day before we got back, uh, Frank was in a bar having a drink with a Belizean man. He often winds up in bars having drinks with people. <laughs> and um, they were about the same age in their early 50s and they got to talking about cowboy movies that they both grew up watching. And so the gentleman, the Belizean man said to him, so, what about the Badlands? What do the Badlands look like? Apparently, you know, the cowboy movies, movies feature the Badlands a lot, and many of them were shot in the Badlands. So Frank said, mm, I don't know, I've never seen it. The Belgian man said, what? But you live in America, right? <laughs> and Frank said, yes, but I've never seen the Badlands. I said, okay, all right. What, what does the Grand Canyon look like then? And Frank said, uh, I've never seen that either. Man practically gave up, right? Like, what is this American who doesn't know anything of America? So when we got back, Frank said, you know, honey, we cannot go to anybody else's country because we don't know our own. How about we take a couple of months off and drive around the country and see these high, high points, these incredible natural wonders in our country that millions of people from all over the world come to America every year to see, but the majority of us don't know. I was like, sign me up. So we drove around the country for two months, and I have to tell you, when we got to Acadia National Park in Maine, I had the most amazing transformative experience. There's a place in Acadia National Park called Cadillac Mountain, and you're driving up, you're up, you're up the mountain, up and around the mountain, and you're above the clouds, and you're still going up the mountain. And the expanse of beauty that you can see, the sun-dappled islands in the water, the absence of any impact of human, human interference had such a profound effect on my spirit. All of a sudden, looking out there, I realized I had the thought unbidden. You know, the same entity that created all that beauty and perfection also created me. And therefore, I must be beautiful and perfect too. <laughs> And so, from that moment, I have seen myself as nothing but beautiful and perfect. <laughs> and, 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 the really important thing about that is that I see everything else as beautiful and perfect too. Everything and everyone. I am not trying to change anything. I am just really affirming the beauty and perfection of all that is here. And so, as we continued on around the country to places like y the Badlands was so jaw-dropping, I can't even describe it to you, you just have to see it for yourself. And it was when we got to Yellowstone National Park that I suddenly realized that all of these amazingly beautiful places that we were seeing had this tagline behind them, Nation Acadia National Park, Badlands National Park, Yellowstone National Park. So I said, what the heck is a national park? Because I didn't know. And I found that so many people of color and also so many white Americans do not know that we have a system of national parks that spans the country, adding up to 401 at, at latest count. 
These places not only contain the expansive natural beauty of our country, untouched by human hands, but also contains the stories of our history and legacy. And because they are the real thing, they tell the story of all the different segments of Americans who have contributed to the development of our country. Because as we know, no one sector can, be, can claim responsibility for the development of what America is today. So then imagine my joy as I've been here over the past couple of days and found that I could walk in the forest among 200 year old trees right outside of Chicago. I was walking with Wendy Paulson in a, it's a savannah, okay, seeing the bird, the very exotic and beautiful transcontinental flyer, the boba link. I mean, I got to Alaska to do bird watching. And here I was outside of Chicago seeing a bird that I'd never seen before. So I mention all of this to emphasize to you that what you have here is a treasure beyond compare. It's not a little deal. It's a very, very, very big deal. You know, if we had not saved those 200-year-old 200 200 oaks, you can't just go out and plant a 200-year-old oak, if you know what I mean. You know, If you had not saved them, you cannot recapture that. And yet, our ancestors saved them for us, and you have that legacy here in Chicago. I'm very, very pleased. You have a lot to be pleased about. I just want to mention that it is well acknowledged now that people who have access to and utilize open space and treat areas reap incredible benefits. The benefits of improved health, children learn better when they have exposure to the outdoors, um, Richard Louvre, the author and scientist, has proven conclusively that incidences of ADD and AHDD that our young people suffer from are really deeply connected to the fact that we have retrenched from nature and become consumed by our electronic devices. And so they're not getting the benefits of the outdoors. I mean, human beings evolved in nature. So when we get to a place where we're not in nature anymore, it's a really sad commentary on our society, and our preserves enable us to redress that. So on that level alone, they have to be looked at as a very high value asset. Um, you're fortunate to have the University of Illinois Human Environment Research Lab, which is doing considerable work here on the effects of nature as it relates to the prevention of crime and to the promotion of human health. But I want to tell you that in my two days here, I feel like the employees and the people who work for the Forest Preserve are more like, they're more like a family entity than just people who work together. The level of respect and regard that I see expressed between um, uh, General Superintendent Randall and Deputy um, Laria, the level of um, respect that I see that the entire staff gets and gives in the preserves and in the public land system is really very gratifying and very exciting. And I've also noticed from my conversations with um, people like Jim at the, I have to keep, I have to keep looking at the, the names of the preserves because I really feel like I've seen all 69,000 acres in the last couple of, the, <laughs> couple of days that I've been here. So. Um, So there was, say again? Sandridge, that's right, Jim. Jim at Sandridge, right? It was like he took personal ownership of Sandridge because he grew up in the area. He's very, very passionate about the pioneer heritage. And I was amazed. I mean, this is the first time in my life that I actually saw a covered wagon, even though I've been many places where I might have seen one, I might have seen one before. But the level of pride that the people take also, to me, evidences the freedom that you have given people to be creative. For example, Sue yesterday, was that at Crabtree? Yes, who has developed an entire playground using the most innovative means, and she could do it because you gave her the freedom to do it. So I'm really, I can't overstate how important that is. And I have to tell you, President Preckwinkle, in the eyes of your staff and your people, you literally walk on water. You know, I would not be surprised, seriously. I was like, well, who could there really be such a person? But 
They talk about you as if you walk on water. And that's a really wonderful thing. And I think, you know, it is entirely in keeping with the legacy that you have. Because when I was doing a little bit of background research on the preserve and found out about these guys, um, Perkins and Jensen, who at the turn of the 20th century devoted their lives to the development of the preserve system. I was like, who were these guys who 100 years ago could look into the future and had the vision to see the growth of these communities and to recognize that we would need open spaces? They had such a lot of vision. They said things to the effect that, wait, listen to this. They said they envisioned a crescent surrounding Chicago, starting at the north in the Skokie and North Branch Valley, passing west of the city along the De Plain River, and turning east along the Sag Valley to Lake Cal Calumet, after embracing the highlands of the pa Palos, Palos? I should have asked, Palos. Right, yes, and you know, I imagine that, it, in fact, I know it was not easy, because it took, as I understand it, a 20 year struggle to get this done. And imagine, this is a stroke of genius. I was telling this to my husband, um, who is a, a lawyer, was a lawyer, and I was telling him that um, in order to test the validity of the forest preserve when it was first established, and to make sure that it could not be uh, undercut, underdone, Perkins sued himself. <laughs> the guy sued himself so that, I mean, so that when the judge ruled against him, he, he actually had won because, <laughs> yeah, because the judge was saying the, 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 the forest preserve is on solid ground. It is immutable now. How amazing is that? So I, I, I really feel that the legacy that they have left us must inspire us to the knowledge and the determination that we cannot allow any obstacles to stand in the way of our leaving the preserve system intact, if not vastly augmented, for the next hundred years. We must. We must do that. We must. We must. I have to tell you this. I tell you this a little funny. So I have a wide um, range of girlfriends. A couple of them were up there on the screen in the human and nature presentation. And every now and then they'll get really frustrated about something in academia or something that they're dealing with. And they'll call me and need to vent. And I let them vent for a while. Unless, you know, if it goes over into the pity party, into the pity party state, I'll say, hold it right there. And then I'll say, um, so between you and Harriet Tubman, would you say you're having a harder time? <laughs> And they're like, oh, well, if you put it like that, you know, and suddenly their equilibrium is restored and they can see, you know, with clarity how much we have and how our imped the impediments that we think are so great are really fairly minor given what we have today. Now, one of the things that I've found really, really Interesting. When we started, when Frank and I started our company in 1995 to rectify the lack of information and involvement that we saw in um, African American and Latino communities, there were, we, we really did not see anybody else doing this. But over the years, we have come to find that there were outdoor organizations of people of color that were established long before ours and had been doing this all along. And still today, in 2013, that fallacy persists that people of color are not interested, engaged, whatever, in the environment and in the outdoors. My response to that is really, you know, people really cannot participate in what they don't know about. So talk to me after you've given the people the information and introduced them and shown them. Then we can talk if they're not there, okay? So I just want to share that things are not always what they seem. I love that, um, that image because I was actually there in Badlands National Park last year when that image was taken. The Milky Way galaxy in full relief over the Badlands National Park. Imagine being able to see that from Chicago. And I like to title my presentation, We All Live Under the Same Sky, because I am intent on making people aware that these artificial designations that we've set up about who does what or who is capable of doing what are just that. They're artificial. We made them up, and we can unmake them too. Ha! I love this guy. 
Dr. S oh, there's, there's supposed to be captions on there. But anyway, Dr. Story Musgrave is the astronaut who in 1993 went up and fixed the Hubble telescope. And he was a guest speaker at the, at the, at the, um, at the astronomy festival. Now, that is a picture of Story Musgrave, okay, hanging out off of Earth at the end of the arm of the space station, fixed in the Hubble telescope, which would give us incredible images of our companions in space. Do you think that um, Mr. Perkins or Jens Jensen could have imagined him doing that? They had a really big imagination. But this was happening just about 50 years after the death of Perkins. I wanted to include that to say, if we could do that 50 years after the death of Perkins, hmm, many, many years, what was that? Almost 90 years after the founding of the Forest Preserve System. No, it couldn't be 90 years, but anyway, 80 years or something, right? If we could do that 80 years after the founding of the Forest Preserve System, what can we not do now? Now, I wanna show you this image of these mountain climbers that are, at this moment on, what is this, June 12th? They're on their way to the summit of Denali, Mount Denali in Alaska. Mount Denali is the highest mountain on the North American continent, 20,320 feet of ice clad power. I was up there last year and I wrote about that in my book. I mean, it's, that mountain is called the Great One and really it is so great it makes its own weather system. These people are right now on that mountain making their way to the summit. I bet you never expected them to look like this. <laughs> that is Team Denali. I'm part of their support team, okay? Yes, yes. And they are seeking to make this ascent of the mountain in cooperation with the National Outdoor Leadership School in order to provide a platform for a wider discussion around the country of the role and the, the, the position of uh, African Americans and people of color in the outdoors movement. Bet you never thought you'd see this either. This is a, this is a group of uh, boaters from the Black Boaters Summit that goes down to the Virgin Islands every year um, to learn to sail and swim, well, not to learn to swim, but to sail and swim and snorkel and motor. I just wanna show you that, you know, who we think of as not being present has been present all along, okay? And so maybe if we're able to shift our thinking a little bit, we will move away from the idea of the difficulty of getting people involved to how can can we build up on what is already happening to get more people involved? This is a group of, um, this organization is the National Association of Black Scuba Divers who are now training young people in Biscayne National Park to become um, underwater archeologists and to help document the shipwrecks that may have brought their enslaved ancestors to this uh, hemisphere. How amazing is that? This is my friend Jared Manis. He's also one of the writers for Humans and Nature. And Jared has a program called um, the Great Plains Restoration Council, but his program is called uh, Restoration, Not Incarceration. And part, a big part of what he does is to divert um, uh, first offenders from the prison system into uh, the restoration of the plains and also the restoration of their own lives. This is a group that we helped to start out of Atlanta called Keeping It Wild, and they do service work all over the country, all over the, um, all over the state of Georgia, right there, they're on Cumberland Island National Seashore. And uh, they're just growing by leaps and bounds. And this is just a small, oh, this is my favorite. This young man, Juan Martinez, grew up in South Central LA, tough neighborhood, and that's his family right there. And um, one got into trouble in high school uh, 15 years ago. And as part of his punishment, he was offered the chance to go to detention or go to the eco club. He went to the eco club, the teacher handed him a packet of seeds, a handful of, a handful of packets of seeds. He chose a packet of jalapeno seeds because he wanted to make jalapenos and grow jalapenos for his mom. As a result of that, one had the opportunity to go to the Grand Tetons National Park in Wyoming changed his entire life. One was last year declared a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Okay? And he is one of the foremost speakers in the country on how to engage people in the millen millennial generation with the great American outdoors and with nature and what it means to their lives. 
So I just wanted to show you those to tell you that it might not be as hard as people think it is that we have to go get those people and we got to go inculcating them a love for nature because they so and all the negatives really because I've heard that I mean people have told me well you know people of color don't even care about the environment because they have too many survival issues madam president you said that to a large degree the business community doesn't really see open space because they're looking at economic and other issues can I just tell you open space is one of the largest economic drivers in the country in the, the National Park Service, the National Parks Conservation Association, on whose board I've served for a long time, found that for every dollar invested in the national parks, it returned ten dollars to the gateway communities outside. So, the the public lands, the public land system, open space are the most incredible passive, you know, drivers of the economy. And I think that that's one of the things that the business community needs to look at as you move forward with the commission about what you will do for the next many years. When we were out birding with Wendy yesterday, I was like, oh my God, I can see birders coming from all over the world to bird in that savanna, correct? Because it was just so beautiful and so wonderful. And this is a place that has been restored to its former glory. So now, the, I'm certain that my time is running out. I was going to be keeping track. But I want to suggest to you that how I think things might work as you move forward into the, into the next century. The biggest thing that we have to recognize is, you know what? The preserves are not an afterthought. The preserves are the center of our lives. The preserves provide everything that we need. So we have gotten so far away now from the realization that everything that we use and everything that we are comes out of nature, duh. So we have the preponderance of, of electronics, but it all comes out of nature. Nature is our life support system. More and more as we go through the park system, we are seeing how the ravages of climate change are already affecting everything everywhere, from the Great Smoky Mountains to the giant sequoias that have been alive on Earth for 2,000 years, and now they're vulnerable to climate change because the climate is heating up so much they can't accommodate it. So what you have here is also a hedge against the ravages of climate change because, you know, open space, space, everything, everything that is natural acts as a buffer, okay? The trees help to put more oxygen in our air, to clean more of our air. So the, the preserves must be seen as the nucleus around which we organize. And I'll tell you, I am so fortunate today because in the audience, I have this guy, Stuart Stroll, who's my longtime friend, and he's now head of the Zoological Society, or he runs the Chicago Zoo. And I mentioned, I mentioned, I mentioned Stuart because one of the chief impediments that um, groups of, and organizations of color have in doing this work of expanding and reaching out to their communities and engaging them with nature is um, the lack of resources. And in conversation with people here, I ask, so what is the challenge for the preserve, right? It's, well, it's to reach out and engage more communities that have not been served, and also it's money. So here's how it worked in South Florida when, uh, when right after Frank and I got back, the Everglades Restoration Project was just getting underway. And of course, we, the, the, it was stated that in order for the project to be successful, we had to engage the people of color, the African Americans, the Latinos, with the rest, along with all the other communities in the restoration. So we were like, well, yeah, we can do that because we had just come from around the country. Our eyes were still filled with stars from all the beauty that we had seen. We could do that. We could do that. So we tried to apply for all of these grants and all of these contracts to get to do the work. No, it wasn't happening. And then Stuart had the brilliant idea. Well, let us partner to get, let's partner and apply for a grant from the South Florida Water Management District and the EPA. Bam! Before you know it, we're big time consultants. Okay? Over time, we're streaming so much information into the black community. Okay, we're bringing information through the radio. We're writing stories to, in the black press, which reaches the particular communities that we were targeting. We're t having biz meetings with the business sector, with the civic leaders. We're having, we're having meetings with travel aid. We're having meetings with everybody who needs to be at the table. So I think that, and before long, there were more African Americans and people of color turning out to the government meetings than there were white people. That was such, that 
that was like a 180 degree change. And it happened because the person who was in a mainstream organization at that time, Stuart was heading up the National Audubon Society's um, Everglades Restoration Office. Because he chose to align himself with a small community organization. We accomplished so much that the Everglades Coalition gave us their big um, leadership award. Was that in 1997, 19, something like that? Something like that. So when I'm in the when I'm in Chicago, before I came here, I talked with I called up all my friends in the area to say, well, what is the forest preserve like? And you know, really are they how are they with the people? And so I called Michael Howard. Michael said, Oh yeah, I've been working with the Forest Preserve for a long, long time. I called up my friend um, Naomi at Blackson Green. She said, Oh yeah, they're cool, they're doing all kinds of things. I called up Outdoor Afro out of Chicago and I said, You got anybody in um in uh uh, anything going on in Chicago? And she said, oh yeah, as a matter of fact, um, Outdoor Afro is going on a hike this very weekend with uh, Wild Indigo. And then I got a chance myself to go on a hike with Wild Indigo and Nambi and Nikki. Here we are in this um, sand prairie and Judy, and they're, they're walking and they're, they're, they're leading us through this um, area. And you should have seen the excitement in these African Americans who have just been introduced to this area and this area of nature and this area of conservation, they are all agog with enthusiasm. And so I want to emphasize to you that you already have the makings of what you need. Yes, you might wonder, how do you get it up to scale? But Michael can tell you, Michael who runs Eden Place, who cleaned up how many acres of um, contaminated land to create Eden Place, which then won a big EPA award, which is then the subject of a TV documentary, he can help you with that. You know, he. <laughs> Right, right, he can tell you what needs to be done because he's already in touch with the people at the grassroots who need the services. I am really, I've been really so happy to see that you are connected to so many groups, large and small. We were at the um, Botanical Gardens yesterday. I was, my heart was overflowing with joy. And these are all serious partners. You have the big partners and you have the smaller partners and you have the opportunity now to inculcate even more partners. And that is what I presume and see you doing over the next um, four or five years. The big thing that I want to leave you with is this. Nature is a human thing. Humans are part of nature. It's not like nature's out there and we're over here. And so those people over there just don't have the appreciation of our kind. We are all in this thing together. By virtue of being human, we all stand at the same place on the grand scale. We all have as much invested in this as Jensen and, um, and, and uh, Perkins did. And we owe it to them. We owe it to the future generations. We owe it to the public land system, the forest preserves that we have to exert every ounce of our influence and every fiber of our being to make sure that the 69,000 acres of preserve that we have in uh, Cook County today sir, continue to serve all the people, expand their service to the people, and are preserved intact and even augmented for the next 100 years. Thank you so much. We welcome, thank you, Audrey. We welcome back uh, Arnold Randall and introduce Wendy Paulson. Wendy is a uh, co-chair of the Next Century Conservation Plan and serves as chair emerita of RARE, an international conservation organization that trains local leaders to inspire conservation in communities around the world. We're moving into, as you can see, a panel discussion right now, and we will uh, have you out of here by 10.30. Uh, we have a hard out, so everybody can go to work, <laughs> as they say in the TV business. Uh, first question is for everyone. Wendy, we'll start with you and move uh, west. And, uh, and then I'll have some individual questions for you. But the first question is, um, 
We've seen the, and heard the role that nature plays in an urban environment. You've all heard a keynote on our national perspective. What uh, can you consider as the role that nature can play as an agent for change or a solution to the problems of an urban area, of a city? Wendy? Well, I think it's, it's working. Is that working? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. I don't think that the issue is that different from the one that was facing Perkins and, and Jensen. Jensen. Uh, they saw what was coming, the, the intense development, the, the, uh, all that goes with that, the, the noise, the clamor, the distraction. And they saw, I mean, I, I, every time I go into a forest preserve, I was telling Audrey yesterday, I, and I encourage others to really pause and be consciously grateful to those visionaries that saw that we needed to provide oases um, from, you know, as, as wonderful as some of the urban development has been, we, we need a counterbalance. And the, the, I think the restorative and healing power of nature is something we can't overemphasize. And I was interested in a couple of Audrey's examples um, that you had there, um, and I forget the, the I'm as bad on names, <laughs> but, but they reminded me, when I was in Washington, D.C. for a few years, I became very intrigued with the Earth Conservation Corps that was focusing on the Anacostia River, which is Washington's forgotten river. And they were, it was actually a group of young people that got together. They were unemployed and decided they would focus on cleaning up the river. Um, they have now, they work mostly actually with adjudicated youth. And I looked up last night, I just wanted to refresh myself with their, their mission, um, which is to empower our endangered youth to reclaim the Anacostia River, their communities, and their lives. And I think that says it all. It, it, it just, the, the, um, the, you know, the, the natural instinct for people to want to do good and to, to be helpful, uh, it, it, it helps the landscapes, or the waterscapes in this, ca in this case, but it also helps them. And, it, and it, it, it's, there's, a, there's a healing power there that is um, all encompassing. You know, I, um, I, I grew up in the city. I'm a South Sider. I, I still live on the South Side of the city. I spent my whole life there. Um, but I had the benefit of parents who were very interested in being out in nature, and, and particularly uh, they were horseback riders, so we spent a lot of time on farms. And I spent a lot of time shoveling horse manure and things like that, <laughs> uh, which I did not appreciate at the time. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we also spend time fishing, and we spend time, you know, hiking around and looking under rocks and finding turtles, and and there is real value to young people, especially, but anybody, to sort of have that time to sort of unwind and commune with nature. And I, uh, I recognize that still living in a city, I see a lot of young people and families that would benefit from that. And I think we are so wound up in technology, but we're also wound up in sort of the stresses of urban life, and so has been said a few times, you know, uh, urban life is difficult for a lot of reasons. Uh, and people struggle with a lot of different issues. And I think being in nature, frankly, doing simple, doing the simple things, going fishing, just taking time to sort of relax and be there and absorb it, walking, taking a, a trail hike and, 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 and seeing, learning about something new. There's real value in doing that and working with your hands, frankly, I think, you know, uh, is there's some real value in sort of working with, with your hands. I think the young people that we've had a chance to, to sort of recruit and get into what we're doing here in the Forest Preserves, I think when they get out and they do work days with us and they do those, they're really passionate about it. And they're also uh, young people who, who have been on the wrong side of the law. You know, I had a chance to visit uh, the boot camp at Cook County Jail and you know, the Botanic Gardens very involved with that. And those young people get educated about nature and they are growing things and they're, they're, they're nurturing things and they're whole different people. They have a whole different experience and they're very passionate about it. Uh, so you can see there's very real examples of how nature changes people's perspective uh, from, from what it was and you know, I think you mentioned in your presentation the gentleman Juan Martinez from, Martinez. from California. You know, Juan was a speaker at our Chicago Wilderness Conference really? last year. Yeah. That's my son. <laughs> yeah. He's a sharp guy. <laughs> he's a very, uh, you know, he's a dynamic guy as well. Uh, there are many millions of Juan Martinez's out there who, yes. need, who need to be yeah. exposed and so uh, it does change things uh, from my, my own personal experience but also in watching other people. 
Well, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up grow, running wild and free in Jamaica, eating mangoes right off the tree, you know, swimming in the river with the mangoes coming down to me, bobbing on the water. So I've never known anything but um, pleasure in the outdoors, the comfort of nature. I realize that not every young person now has the opportunity to do that. But if we rec once we realize the value of children being able to run free and to experience press themselves and discover themselves in nature, then how fortunate are we that we have such things as the preserves available to them to, um, to uh, conduct that activity in. I really think that um, as more and more uh, becomes obvious about the change in climate, more and more urban people are beginning to see and look for other ways to support the environment to, to be environmentally responsible. So I think we're at a very wonderful pivotal point and we don't really have to do very much except you know, fan the flames that are there now to really start a lightning movement of, of, of um, conserving, conserving green space, uh, helping to transform our environment from this very consumptive, consumer-based, polluting thing that we have now, which is totally unsustainable. I'm going to throw my two cents in, if I may, for a minute. You know, the nature sells itself, uh, but you have to get the people there to really appreciate it. We have two problems uh, that are pretty tough. One, we have invasive species that are consuming our forest preserves. We had a moratorium on the clearing for uh, years, and um, the, you know, they'll, we'll lose them, uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the natives. The second, we have a violence problem in two sections of the city. Uh, we've heard of all that. Uh, we have an unemployment rate from 70 to, Christ, 70, 100 percent in many ways. We have, uh, you know, one parent families. Uh, many times a child can get into his teens, well into his teens, without ever knowing somebody who has had a job. Uh, and, of course, with the access to guns, we're literally killing each other. I would say, why don't we get some federal money, and I think this would be an easy sell. Create a Let's CCC yes. group, a quasi-military service. These kids should be in the service. And have veterans run it. So as we move into the forest preserve, get them out there, clear the species, Treat them, or teach them a discipline, pay them, and have them go back and communicate uh, into the neighborhoods, or at least save them. Well, Phil, I think you should be on this panel. Because <laughs> that's a really, really um, good idea. And I know that there are a lot of entities that are now, as I said, the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, is doing research work on you know, how to use nature as therapy, as transformative for people who are prone to violence, etc. So there's great potential there. Um, and I think that given the leverage that we have to raise this to a natural perspective. I mean, right here in Chicago, we have the Johnson, the Johnson family, the publishing family. I mean, they could really start something big if they you know, were persuaded of the value of the preserves to transform lives, because everybody's looking for solutions. So they could carry your water for you to the White House and beyond. <laughs> And I think that's a key point, Valerie, uh, um, Audrey, the, um, just recognizing that value. And I think Richard Louv, if, if, I assume that since this is the choir, that everybody knows the book that you mentioned, The Last Child in the Woods, has sparked such a responsive chord um, because I think parents, grandparents, educators from centuries, or for, for decades, um, have recognized that 
restorative, transformational power of nature. And yes. it just so much, in, in, in so many ways, mitigates so many of the artificial challenges Absolutely. that, that, that artificial. we have. And I, I, I like to think, I, uh, somewhere I think, Arnold, in your slides, there was something about the, being in the quiet. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved to think of being alone with your thoughts in nature. I think that's something that so many young people growing up today hardly have know what it's like to be alone with your thoughts because there's so much coming on. But but um, experience in nature does allow and nurture that. Good. Well, Arnold, uh, here's a question. I uh, hope everybody can join in. How do we get people? especially young people, into the forest preserves. I was on the National Park Foundation. We talked all the time about getting the minority groups who never know of uh, the national parks out there. You have to travel through strange, hostile territory to find the beauty of nature and really appreciate it with families. And we would have discounts and uh, special uh, projects. But do we have to resort to a rock concert in the middle of Yosemite or Yellowstone to, to draw them in? Um, any ideas? Yeah, we, we, this is something we've been, we've been working on and uh, developing for the two and a half years we've been here. We recognize, and President Preckwinkle and I, you know, and Mary uh, Lariah, we talked about this earlier on, said, you know, there's just a lot of people who are not here. And uh, they tend to be folks who are from, from urban areas and people of color. And, you know, and not 100%, but certainly that was a big challenge. And we recognized we wanted to do something about that. Uh, so, you know, we, we talked about how do you better market the preserves. And, you know, we have some, you know, we're doing a better job of that. But the reality is you have to go where people are. And you have to bring your programs. And you have to bring the animals and, the, and all the things that you do. You have to bring it out to where the people are to get them uh, to, to pique their interest. And uh, so we're doing that. And we're building relationships with organizations in communities, uh, organizations that have access to families and, and young people to get them connected to the preserves. So, you know, we've been working with Michael Howard for years, but we're also reaching out to new groups. We're reaching out to ch uh, church groups. And schools are a big deal. So schools are a big part of it. Schools are in every community. So we're working. You know, we've historically done some really nice things uh, with schools, but it's sort of been scattershot. It hasn't been sort of a systemic way of looking at making sure that we're hitting communities that we want to hit. Uh, so we're, we're doing more with that. Um, we're doing more with organizations, you know, the obvious organizations like the YMCA and the Scouts, and we're working with the Chicago Park District and working with the Suburban Park District. So where people are, we're reaching out to organizations that have roots in those communities in the first place. We're, we're knocking down some of the barriers. So education and information is the number one barrier that people don't know. Um, number two, though, is transportation. So the reality is there's very few places in the preserves where you can get on a train or a bus and get there. There's some, but not enough. Uh, so we recognize that's a barrier. We're putting resources toward bus transportation. And we're, we're sitting down and having those conversations with organizations. We want you to come out. We'll provide a bus the first time. Um, we'd like, you know, we'll help you with the additional ones, but we want you to come back. And so we had a really nice event this past Saturday at Bobian Woods on the far south side of the city of Chicago. And the last few years we did it, it's always been a very successful event, good turnout. This year, the turnout was off the charts. And it was off the charts because we have staff now. We made a good relationship with the Chicago Housing Authority that has all the gardens. This is right next to it. And most of those folks had never been to Bobby Inn because they were scared because it historically it was a bad place to go. Um, but this year, we had busloads of residents from all Gale Gardens coming to the event. And so these are kids and, and families who are like, wow, I didn't know this was here. And we can go fishing. And well, we can get on a canoe now. And we can do these things. So they're going to come back. And we're encouraging them to come back, not just to special events, but to come out on their own with their families. And so that's how you have to get at that level. You can market and do all the high level stuff. We can do all the social media. We're doing a lot of that stuff, Facebook and Twitter. This, this, this event is being, being tweeted right now, as I understand it. Um, but you got to go out and talk to people. And so the Wild Indigo folks, for example, they're talking to talk of the people who we want to reach. And so they know how to talk to, to folks in communities and why it's important to them. And once they get them out, and they're very passionate. And they sell it, they sell it very well. Once people get out, I'm convinced once people get out and they have a positive experience, they will want to come back. So that's, that's what we're doing, and we're always open to new ideas. Audrey is jumping in. Wonderful. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, I wanted to respond, Bill, and, and say that um, in terms of the national parks, uh, one of the key things we found is a lack of basic information. For example, the vast majority of people of color don't know that there are hotels in the national parks. And so, you know, they think that they have to go rough it and camp, et cetera, and people don't want to be uncomfortable. When I 
tell them that there are five star hotels in the parks that President Kennedy stayed at and Queen Elizabeth II stayed at, they're like, you've got to be kidding me. And then when I tell them how affordable it is and how little hiking and climbing, and you know, you could just walk around and have a really good time. And it's the same thing for the Forest Preserve. I remember when you, we had a phone conversation and I mentioned that as we were planning for the new campgrounds, we really ought to emphasize the availability of cabins so that people can have a comfortable experience because they want to be comfortable. And um, one of the key things that we found too about engaging people with the public land system, show them where they have history. Show them how their history is all intertwined with that. And in the case of Chicago, the city that was built on the banks of the, the settlement that was built on the banks of the Chicago River by a black man from Haiti named um, DeSabo. I mean, come on. So everything in Cook County has some black history. So let's emphasize that, you know? Let's emphasize the connections. Yes, Wendy, sorry. I, that's okay, no, and I, w I was just gonna add, I was really glad, Arnold, to hear you uh, mention the schools because I think that that is an infrastructure that's there that we sometimes can overlook and think that there may need to be a, an in initiative to create an educational system to get, you don't. Um, you've got the schools, I, we've got the most incredible um, volunteer stewardship network in the nation, <laughs> um, I'm convinced of that. I'd love to see a, a volunteer education or ambassador network because often the schools, teachers feel they're overburdened, I understand that, you know, with all kinds of curriculum demands, but if we had people like the ones in this room that are familiar with the forest preserves, that love them, that see the value of them, to, to be able to go out and lead groups in, and then those children become teachers to their parents too, and they become guides for their parents, and I think that's a, there's, that infrastructure is just part of, you know, what you've cited, I think there, Cook County does have so much here, and that's just a another um, essential element. You know, in, in many ways, well, in, in all ways, the problems of the national parks are the problems of the yeah. Cook County Forest Absolutely. Preserve. Uh, you need to educate, and you have, what we're really talking about is marketing. Marketing, education, information that flows down to however and wherever we can get it. Let me throw out an idea, and Audrey, I want it to fall on your ears because you can sell it. <laughs> um, we need a new core of discovery. Yes. A new wow. Lewis and Clark yeah. missions. Um, the reason is climate change. You put your finger on it. Yes. Do you know in Illinois, we have a map over in the Department of uh, Environment in the city showing how the climate is changing the growing patterns and, and zones moving north. Now, good for some, bad for others when they lose, uh, you know, the, the moisture. Um, that's education and that requires exploration. Yes. And if we can give a reason for the kids especially to get into the forest preserves and in an organized way be searching for plants that weren't there 20 years ago. Let them enjoy the discovery. Yes. And that core of discovery, if we repeat it from national to the local, um, can spread across the country. <laughs> So there you know the truth. <laughs> so it's up to you. To so can we go on the road together, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> oh, anyway, next question. <laughs> um, so Audrey, um, how well? How do you uh, get these uh, ethnic groups into both the national park, but also the forest preserves? Well, I inspire them because I'm so excited about it. You know, you can, if you're sending somebody to do outreach to people and they're like really not excited, they're just like this, it's not going to work. And you have to have the love and the passion for the resource and then communicate that to others. And one of the key things I've found was if you organize something in the park, you know, or just organize an event, invite people to something. So one, you're giving them an invitation 
that they might not have had before, and you're providing them with something to do. They know that there's going to be something for them to do, because very often people have no idea what there is to do in these parks, preserves, etc. So you have to let them know. And an organized event is the best um, way to get people into the... You know, in, in, in Miami some time ago, we had the opportunity to take a group of families from Liberty City, which is one of the more depressed areas in the country, down to, we took them down to Everglades National Park, 45 minutes away from their neighborhood. Some of the people who were in their 60s, they were like, they were transfixed. They were like, are you trying to tell me that this was here all the time and I've lived here my entire life and I didn't know? I mean, it was amazing. And yet, when the, um, when the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to uh, expand a, a Homestead Air Force Base nearby, be between Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park, into an international um, airport, those same people from this poor neighborhood, many of whom had never spoken in public before, came to the meetings and stood up in front of all those people with all the brass and said, this far and no further shall you go. Because we've discovered a place where nature is free and we must have those places where nature can thrive. So I am, I am here to say that everybody can be a lover of the parks, the preserves, our public land system, and everybody can be an advocate. It sells itself, does it? Yeah. And, and that... And it doesn't need to be just big, splashy events you right. know, organized by the Forest Preserve. I think, again, part of our the um, wonderful infrastructure here in Cook County is just um, an astonishing network of community conservation groups, Audubon yes. clubs, nature clubs, groups like Wild Indigo, that I think those partnerships with those, they're the ones that actually reach the, the various communities yes. and get them involved. And, and that's a, even a, a more meaningful experience, I think, when you're there um, with friends, with family, um, discovering something that you had no idea existed before. Yeah. Because people don't go to parks to prove a point. They go to have fun and enjoy themselves. Yeah. That's the bottom line. You know, it's a fun thing. That's right. I, I, think, I think the other thing that's uh, for our, our landscapes and what we have here in, in Cook County is that interpretation, how you understand what you're seeing is really yes. important. Uh, there, there are no mountains. There are nice roads rolling hills out in Palos and there's, you know, we have these un these wonderful locations, but I think for the untrained or, you know, sort of you, you don't have the information yet, not fully understanding what you're seeing can be an impediment and it can be like, well, what, well why is this important? particularly for younger people. And I think part of what we want to do is to help people through education, through uh, better interpretive signage things, so you understand what you're looking at and why it's valuable. I think it's, people understand trees, people, but I don't know that people always understand a prairie or a savanna or certain things, in, or a wetland and why that's important and what's significant about it. So education really is important and making it fun education, that it's a fun way to learn about these things. You know, our nature centers do a really good job of that. We just need to do more of it. And so the more we can educate people, the more we can provide curriculum at the school before the kids ever come out to the forest preserve so they know what they're looking at. And there's 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 some challenge when you come out, uh, the better off we're all gonna be and the more you know passionate. And once they get it though, like I said, I've seen some young people who've been transformed. Once they get it, they are hooked and they love it and they know more about it, you know, than a lot of adults. And one of the best ways to learn is to actually do, do things. It. And yeah. I think Hands that the, the fact that we've got this volunteer stewardship network in Cook County, which as I say is a, is a model, I think I, it took me needing to leave the Chicago area to realize how extraordinary yes. it is. It is one of the best learning mechanisms. And I think that's what, what binds people um, to the preserves and to the restoration efforts because they're learning all the time. Plus, they're doing something good and they, they love, you know, I think anyone likes to make a difference. And uh, the, I don't know what the numbers are. I used to say over 7,000 people. I'm not sure what, what we have when you begin to add up all the very various efforts, but that's a powerful force for, for nature, for nature restoration. There goes that microphone again. Um, you know, it's almost laughable. The, the jewel uh, we have in forest preserves, you, you almost have to say to yourself, God, how did we wind up with 11% of our land in Cook County as nature? Can you yes. imagine with mm -hmm. 5 million people living here? Um, <laughs> 69,000 acres, acres. I mean, it leaves you breathless. It Truly. is a national park. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How do, uh, and yet, so few people, re 
most people take it for granted. Yeah. So few people actually appreciate it. Now, let me ask you a more specific question, Arnold. Do you have buses that go out to the forest preserves if, we want, if somebody wanted to get on at, uh, in, in, in the interior of the city? In the interior of the city. So what we're doing, Bill, is that we are, we've set, we actually, through our foundation and through our own regular budget, we've set aside a lot of money for transportation. So what we're doing now and what we're looking at, and I'll tell you what we're looking at doing moving forward, but what we're doing now is, is we reach out to organizations and they say, look, I, we'd love to come. We, don't, we can't get out there. We don't have the resources. That's not an impediment anymore. We take, that, we take that off the table. We'll pay for busing to get folks out. But they have to commit to doing something else. They have to commit to coming back. They have to commit to being involved involved in some other things because we don't want it to be a one one and done you come and then we never see you again we want you to come and come back either volunteer we want you to come and be part of some of our special events uh, or you know regular program opportunities so we are paying for transportation and that's an education piece we've always paid for some transportation but we didn't widely advertise it and we didn't we're doing more of that now in the long term some of our plans are create spaces where people can get to by public transportation and create a, a trolley service or a bus service that will mm -hmm. take you from one of those places to deeper into the interior of the forest preserve system. So you can get to our headquarters building in River Forest by train or bus. Uh, why not make that a place where you can then, you know, you know, every Saturday morning or Sunday morning you can get on that bus or in the summer every day you can get on that bus if you get there by 9 o'clock and you'll be taken to Palos. You'll be taken to some Wonderful. other preserve. So we are looking at that as, mm. as a longer term solution to, to, to resolve this issue around transportation. You'll be, you'll be taken there, can you get back? <laughs> <laughs> if you miss the bus, well, it's on you, right? <laughs> we, I did a, a science series for PBS <laughs> called The New Explorers, and we uh, engaged all the uh, science museums uh, and non-science museums, and uh, the Department of Education actually paid for kids to get on a bus and classes and go to the institutions and we found that the at the end of everything in our analysis the most important thing was the bus ride yeah. <laughs> because they didn't have a way before then to get there and many had never seen the lake even though they lived blocks away so that in itself becomes an education and then you have a payoff when you get there yeah you know it's it's interesting uh, for city people and you know I, I'm, I'm guilty of this too the only preserve I ever went to was Green Lake pool when I was a kid only because my grandmother lived across the street that's all I knew about the forest preserves um, so but the forest preserves seem like they must have been a hundred miles away but so we have to get people over this sort of mental barrier that is really far away because it's not it's not far away at all and so our challenge is to sort of get people to say you know 25 minutes is not far, or a half an hour is not far at all to be in the middle, be immersed in nature, to, to be away from the city completely. So that's a mental block and an education piece that is, I think, is a barrier that we're working through as well. Uh, I have two images. Um, one is uh, in the material. I don't know if you have it uh, that uh, Bill Letter sent me. And it's that uh, marvelously romantic uh, picture of uh, ladies in their flowing white <laughs> gowns having taken the train out to the preserve for a picnic, a picnic and softball, <laughs> and uh, how how cool! This was back uh, when the forest preserves were first created as sort of the um, air conditioner for mm. the city uh, in a European style, as were our boulevards, to get people out there. My second image is of an overgrown, buckthorn-filled. Uh, a mm -hmm. space where it's difficult to just get into it rather than have uh, this wonderful uh, experience. So, um, Arnold, I'm, that's a little critical, I'm sorry, but I think that we have to do a lot of things all at once. One is, you know, dedicate ourselves to preserving the preserves. <laughs> Two, it's then to set up a mechanism to get people out there so they can enjoy it and assume that everybody doesn't have a car and then really work the education thing. I agree. I mean, the restoration piece is key. It's, it's the core of what we do. It has to happen all at the same time. You know, our volunteers, as Wendy has mentioned, our volunteer base is, uh, is unbelievable. And the work that they do, we could never pay. You know, we never have enough money to do all the work that they do. 
Uh, our staff do a ton of that work and we pay contracts. So there's a lot of that, but there's, we'll be doing restoration work long after all of us are no longer here because it's so big. But um, it, the more people we can get tied in, the more volunteers we can get tied in, the more outside groups that can be part of it, you know, a rising tide, you know, raises all ships. So we, we need to make sure that we grow the base, the base of people who are participating and we can do more. Uh, if we're just operating sort of under the radar as we historically had in the forest preserves, uh, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're swimming upstream. And so the reality is the more people we get involved, the more people understand that it's valuable, uh, it should be protected, it shouldn't be uh, set aside for redevelopment, or we shouldn't use it as a stormwater detention basin, or things that are real threats to us. And people realize that they have positive associations with the forest preserves. And you know, everybody's not gonna be out pulling garlic mustard and buckthorn. If, but if you just come and you fish, or you ride a bike, or you do a bird watch, that's great too, because you have a positive association with us, and you know that it needs to be protected. That's really important. And, and may I emphasize that um, although not everybody has a car, very many people do. And I make that point because lots of times in talking about the national parks and visitation, for example, the assumption is always made, is often made, that people of Americans of color don't utilize the parks because they don't have the resources, which is a complete fallacy because the uh, travel dollars spent by African Americans and Latinos is in the billions of dollars. And they go to the Caribbean, they go to Europe, they go to Asia, they go to Africa. They're not going to the places nearby because nobody has told them the places are there. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Uh, some final uh, thoughts before we wrap it up. Well, I was just going to say I really was glad to hear President Prankwinkle um, emphasize that she'd love to see the forest preserves rank right up, or maybe it was you, Arnold, <laughs> that rank right up with the lakefront, with the Chicago Bulls, with, with whatever. And last year it was interesting to me, there was a, a global um, council, it happened to be from BirdLife International, it was here with representatives from Asia, Africa, South America, Europe, and a number of them, before they came, first thing they did was to look up Cook County forest preserves, because they'd heard of these and that was where they wanted to go and speak to the transportation they figured they did hire somebody to take them out but that's where they wanted to go and it gets to that example you had of Frank you know not knowing the the, um, the Grand Canyon and right. the, the Badlands in, to his Belizean friend and here are people coming from other parts of the world exactly coming right to these spots so sometimes I think it, we don't even we don't know and value enough what we've got right here and um, the, the infrastructure is there I think the transportation is a, is a piece that needs to be worked on, but so many of the other pieces um, are already in place, and it's just getting them flowing. Yes. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's uh, the most diverse um, piece of land in Illinois, but it's one of the most diverse in the entire country. It's the uh, northern boundary of the southern hardwoods. It's the western boundary of the eastern deciduous forest. It's the beginning of the north woods and it's the gateway to the tall grass prairie that goes all the way to Kansas, Canada, and Oklahoma. So there's an awful lot of nature to talk about, but we have to put that in a package and say this is really unique as is Chicago sitting on the edge of a lake. Right, right Audrey? Right. Right. Right on. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I know everybody wants to uh, come up and talk to Audrey. I want to thank everybody for coming today. What a wonderful way to kick off this campaign. Yeah, hoo hoo! Good night,